Hello, my friends, and welcome to another excellent episode of Stand Up with Pete Dominic Daly. This is episode 324. Today, my guests are from PBS Frontline host Margaret Hoover and the great Barry Ritholtz. I'm Pete Dominic. Stand up with me right now. Stand up. Yeah, we are off, and happy Tuesday, April 6th to you. Thank you very much for joining me on Stand Up Daily, where each and every weekday I give you an awesome recap of the last 24-hour in news, and usually two excellent guests who I can talk with about a wide range of issues that we can all come away from learning much, much more, and sometimes even about ourselves. Thank you very much for supporting the podcast with a paid subscription. If you haven't already, go sign up now. What are you waiting for? Send me some of that sweet cash, like five bucks a month or more. Thank you to all the new subscribers. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or the paid subscription link in the show notes and join us every Thursday night for a virtual happy hour on Zoom. Also, very important that you give a five-star rating and write a review for this podcast. If you never have, please do now. Like this excellent five-star review from Bronwyn, who wrote, Pete's guests legit make me care about things I didn't know I cared about. He books the smartest experts on a huge range of topics, and I learn things daily that make me more culturally, politically, and scientifically woke in a way that truly enriches my soul. Thank you for that review, Bronwyn. Now, the rest of you, go write a review if you haven't already. All right. Now, let us move on because I want to get to the news with you. And then, of course, to my great guests. Excited to share my conversation with Margaret Hoover, who joined me for the first time on the podcast. And another amazing conversation with financial wizard expert and always great person to talk to, the brilliant Barry Ritholtz. All right, let me just start with you here on the last 24. Last 24 hours in important news. All right, the COVID headlines first. The U.S. averaging now more than 3 million shots a day as of this past weekend, though online disinformation apparently is sowing vaccine distrust among white evangelicals. Yeah, nearly half of white evangelical adults in the U.S., say they are not getting vaccinated. And on today's show, Barry Ritholtz says that we should just lock them in the churches and let them lick each other. (laughs) The Republican governors of Florida and Mississippi have voiced opposition to vaccine passports, credentials that would show a person's vaccination status, but they're demanding that you show ID to vote, even though you, of course, showed ID when you registered to vote and virtually nobody votes fraudulently. Why? Why? Because why? Why would you do that? A a great penalty of prosecution. Why would you vote fraudulently? Come on. Why would you take that risk? Uh, Maryland is now opening coronavirus vaccine eligibility to the entire state's mass vaccination sites. Anybody who wants one can get one, it looks like. Uh, The CDC is now saying that COVID risk, COVID transmission on surfaces is low. Really? Now they're telling us a year later, a year after people were wiping down their groceries, including me for the first couple of weeks. And then I was like some I mean, basically, my, my wife and daughters were making fun of me and I decided I would rather die of covid than wipe down another box of cereal. And now I am reading that apparently Dr. Uh, Anthony Fauci told Politico Dispatch on Monday that the federal government is not going to mandate the use of vaccine passports for travelers or businesses post pandemic. Fauci said he believes the businesses or schools could require vaccine passports to enter their buildings, says I'm not saying that they should or that they would. But I'm saying you could foresee how an independent entity might say, well, we can't be dealing with you unless we know you're vaccinated, but it's not going to be mandated from the federal government. The EU, by the way, unveiled its proposal for vaccine passports in March, which would allow certain allow citizens who can certify that they've been vaccinated or recently tested negative for COVID-19 to cross borders without quarantine requirements, unless you're in the UK because they're no longer in the EU because of Brexit. Ah, fools. Speaking of the UK, UK, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson confirmed restaurants, pubs and shops will open again as England's lockdown is eased next week, but the ban on foreign travel may remain for a little bit longer. Hello, chimchimaroo, cheerio, can't go anywhere yet. Oh, we'll hang here and 
Hang on to the pub. Sorry. Sorry about that. All right. A couple of other political headlines I wanted to read before I get to some sound bites for you here on The Last 24. I read that a lock of George Washington's hair sold at an auction for nearly $40,000. Who bought that? Who's the person that had 40000 extra dollars for a lock of George Washington's hair? I mean, maybe it's an investment. Maybe, maybe he's just going to flip that hair, a hair flip, and then make more money. That would make sense. Uh, Twitter says it mistakenly suspended Marjorie Taylor Greene's account for a second time. Something tells me it's not a mistake, and they're actually just fucking with her for fucking with us, which I'm fine with. Uh, and the Supreme Court has declined to hear Alex Jones's appeal in the Sandy Hook case. I thought this was an interesting one to mention. The InfoWars host, conspiracy theorist, and terrible husband and father and misshapen man was appealing a Connecticut court sanction in a defamation lawsuit filed by the families of the victims in the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary Massacre. Uh, Alex Jones was penalized by a trial court judge two years ago for angry outburst toward the plaintiff's attorney during his online show. Uh, The attorney uh, for the plaintiff is a uh, gremlin who lives underground and who is affected uh, by water. When she drinks it, she turns into a gremlin, and that is that. And the deep state says Hillary Clinton is a lizard who drinks baby's blood. All right, F Alex Jones all day now and forever. Uh, Speaking of people that need to be F'd forever, it is uh, everybody who is supporting the writing of new voting laws that are doing anything but making it easier for anybody over the 18 age of 18 who is registered registered to vote to do so if they want to. There is a muddying of this debate uh, recently, and I, I'm, I'm pretty outraged and upset by it. But the only thing that matters, really, you always have to start here is why are they creating new laws? Why are southern states who historically had been sanctioned and censured and punished and had to register and get a permission slip from their mommy and daddy, the federal government, before they change any laws because of their history of oppressive and discriminatory laws against people of color, which is what Dr. King and the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s fought to overturn and what many died for. Okay, now Georgia, because they now can because they gutted Dr. King's signature achievement, the Voting Rights Act, Republicans did. Georgia decided to change their laws, even after an almost perfect election in Georgia, according to Republicans. That's really the only thing that you need to know. Here's just a sampling of the whining from these hypocritical losers on the right who have nothing but bullshit conspiracies and culture wars, could care less about policy and so don't make any arguments. But here it is. A little sampling, a little, little smattering of what they're saying to enrage you for a moment. And then I'll read a great debunking from Greg Sargent at The Washington Post to make you feel a little bit better. Major League Baseball is caved to the cancel culture. These corporations are going to face the wrath of GOP officials as well as the tens of millions of American consumers who support them. Major League Baseball believes it now has veto power over the democratic process. Is it time for American conservatives to cancel sports? And maybe then they'd start to respect us a little bit? Ugh, awful. Cancel sports, really? Here's Greg Sarge in the Washington Post. You cannot seriously evaluate the Georgia law without reckoning with its role in a much broader campaign that's unfolding here and with all the damage it's doing. Indeed, that is central to understanding why corporations are reacting this way. Numerous corporations began putting out statements much earlier to condemn Republican efforts to overturn the election. So this whole display isn't just about Georgia. It may reflect a broader cultural impulse toward defending democracy and toward the need to denounce serious threats to it. The point here is not that Major League Baseball deserves to keep its antitrust exemption, something lawmakers have questioned for a long time, nor is it that Major League Baseball was necessarily right to pull the All-Star game out of Atlanta. Rather, it's that Republicans are threatening to use legislative power to punish MLB for criticism of the Georgia law that, while perhaps arguable, plainly constitutes a reasonable stance. This comes after Georgia Republicans tried to nix a tax break for Delta Airlines to punish it for criticizing the law. 
That Republicans are denouncing these things as unacceptable corporate wokeness is revealing enough on its own. It's even more risable that this comes as Republican officials are denouncing efforts to raise corporate tax rates to fund badly needed infrastructure repairs and other job creating proposals as socialism. So well written by Greg Sargent at The Washington Post is simply one of the best at explaining these things. Always read him and follow him on uh, as well. I got to get him on the show. Uh, here is Mitch McConnell being critical of uh, corporations wanting to have a say. You know, the guy who during the height of the covid epidemic protected corporations from covid related lawsuits. Here he is c- criticizing private companies expressing a point of view, which they do all the time. Usually it's for their own interests about tax breaks, minimum wages, etc. Or in Amazon's case, whether or not their employees are pissing in jars. Here's Moscow Mitchell. My advice to the corporate CEOs. Okay, that was me. Here's him. My advice to the corporate CEOs of America is to stay out of politics. Don't pick sides in these big fights. Uh, I think corporations are going to continue to pick sides in these big fights whenever they think it benefits their profits. They've always done that. They're going to continue to always do that. Sometimes it's less overt, but make no mistake. They're always making clear cut decisions on how they can benefit regardless of what's in the public's interest. And in this case, they're still doing that. So last night on MSNBC, Chris Hayes had Bernie Sanders on his program and asked him about this. I just I thought this is great. You have been a critic of corporate power for a very long time. And so I have to imagine you feel very excited to have all these new collaborators and comrades who are going to link arms with you to very seriously take on corporate power in America from the Republican side. It is just extraordinary, Chris. Imagine that. After a trillion dollars of tax breaks, the large corporations that are lowering the corporate tax rate after protecting the pharmaceutical industry from charging us by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Mitch McConnell and his friends are very upset that some corporations are now saying that it is an outrage that in Georgia they are trying to destroy democracy and make it harder for people of color and low-income people to vote. Look, all of this is nothing more than a deflection, and you made that point well, a deflection against the reality that all over this country, what Republicans are doing is trying to protect their interests by making it harder for people who might be voting against them to participate in the political process. That means minorities. That means young people, people who are not sympathetic to their right wing agenda. And our job is, among other things, to pass H.R. 1, an important piece of legislation which says that in America, if you are 18 years of age, no matter what they do in Georgia or any place else, you got the right to vote. That we get rid of. We finally move forward to address Citizens United. And by the way, as you know, Mitch McConnell was the biggest <laughs> yes. Senate defender of Citizens <laughs> United. And the ability of corporations to buy elections. So a lot of continued controversy and conversation about uh, voter suppression laws in Georgia and 40 other states as well. Over 250 of these laws have been written. And I, I just I don't I don't understand the downplaying that I'm hearing in certain circles from Morning Joe to The New York Times to others. I, I'm kind of surprised at what we're what we're hearing and what we're seeing. A lot of this stuff is taken out of context. They're comparing it to New York and at George laws. It's, it's it's all nonsense to me. But maybe I'm missing something. I thought this was a really good point by Eric Levitz at New York Magazine. He says these laws, precisely because their intent is so nefarious, but it's important for us to understand which of Republicans' anti-democratic maneuvers actually work and which don't. So we can focus on the latter and keep this movement out of power. He says the Republicans get exponentially more mileage out of gerrymandering in Senate mail apportionment apportionment than it does from voting restrictions. Seems potentially important for that reality to be widely understood by Democratic lawmakers and activists. I think that's super important that those are issues that are more they have 
more success in cheating and rigging the system and making the system much less representative than it would be based on where people live and how many people live there. You know what? I'm going to go out on a limb and say Republicans from Brian Kemp to Chris Christie to anybody else. I heard Rich Lowry uh, of the National Review arguing that corporate America is wrong not to support voter disenfranchisement. I think that's going to backfire. These guys have lost the thread, and that's fine with me. F all of them forever, as far as I'm concerned. Coming up, I'll ask uh, Margaret Hoover about this. We get more into this. And, of course, we'll continue to talk about it with activists, with uh, constitutional scholars, and more here on Stand Up Daily. Well, the first week of the trial in Minneapolis uh, for Derek Chauvin, who murdered, clearly, George Floyd, uh, in my opinion. I mean, he's got to have a trial, but come on. Anyway, it mostly centered on a blow-by-blow breakdown of his last day, including a whole bunch of videos from cell phones, surveillance cameras, and police body cameras. Uh, Crazy testimony from those who were there, including minors, who watched him, Derek Chauvin, kneel on George Floyd. Descriptions from the paramedics and police supervisors who responded to the scene, and of course, Derek Chauvin's own statements about what happened. And now the proceedings are shifting their focus from what happened to Floyd to a closer analysis of what it all means legally. And we heard today uh, from the chief of police in Minneapolis, who absolutely discredited Derek Chauvin's actions, said they were in no way, shape or form proper. And his testimony is, I think, what got the most attention headlines out of the case on week two, day one. And I want to play that whole, well, I want to play about four minutes from the police chief, Minneapolis Police Chief Madaria Arredondo on Monday, thoroughly rejecting Derek Chauvin's actions and use of force during the arrest of George Floyd last May as contrary to department policy. Here it is. Now, sir, uh, based upon your review of all of the information that you just mentioned, Um, Do you believe that the defendant followed departmental policy 5-304 regarding de-escalation? I absolutely do not agree with that. And how so? Um, That action um, is not de-escalation. And when we talk about uh, the framework of our sanctity of life and when we talk about the principles and values that we have that that action um, goes contrary to uh, to what we're taught as you reflect on exhibit 17 i must ask you is this a trained minneapolis police department defensive tactics technique it is not well, we read the uh, departmental policy on neck restraints is this a neck restraint um, the conscious neck restraint by policy mentions light to moderate pressure. When I look at Exhibit 17 um, and when I look at the facial expression of, of, of Mr. Floyd, that does not appear in any way, shape, or form that that is light to moderate pressure. So is it your belief then that this particular uh, form of restraint, if that's what you, if that's what we'll call it, uh, uh, in fact, violates departmental policy. I absolutely agree that violates our policy. Are you aware now that the defendant maintained this position on George Floyd for nine minutes and 29 seconds? I am aware of that. I believe you testified that force has to be reasonable when it's applied at the beginning and through the entire encounter. Is that right? That is correct. Is what you see in Exhibit 17, in your opinion, within Minneapolis Police Departmental Policy 5-300, authorizing the use of reasonable force? It is not. And why not? That is, that is, uh, it has to be objectively reasonable. We have to take into account uh, the circumstances, information, the threat to the officer, the threat to others. Um, and we, um, the severity of that. Uh, so that is not uh, part of our policy. That is not what we teach. And uh, that should be condoned. When do you believe 
or do you have a belief as to when this restraint, the restraint on the ground that you viewed, should have stopped? Once Mr. Floyd, and this is based on my viewing of the, the, the videos, um, once Mr. Floyd had stopped resisting, and certainly once he was um, uh, in distress and trying to verbalize that, um, that, that should have stopped. Um, there's, there's an initial reasonableness in trying to just get him under control over the, in the first few seconds. But, but uh, once there was no longer any resistance, and clearly when Mr. Floyd was no longer responsive and even motionless, to continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. All right, here are some tweets from uh, some of my favorite legal experts. Glenn Kirshner says, I hope folks are watching the testimony of Minneapolis Police Chief Madaria Arredondo. He's strong, precise, testifying witness, and he strikes me as an example of public service at its finest. I'm inspired. Katie Fang writes, Chief Arredondo said passing a counterfeit $20 bill does not rise to the level of a severe crime. Typically, the person isn't taken into custody because it isn't a violent felony. Ellie Honig, Chief Arredondo reminds me of many of the smart, thoughtful, pro-modernization police chiefs I've worked with over several years. And Elliot Williams tweeted, subtle thing, but more than once when prosecutor had asked about Minneapolis police officers and used the pronoun they, police chief Arredondo had consistently responded with we and us. That's an effective manager, implying the team's successes and failures are both his. And that's a rare move to have the police chief testify against an officer, but a powerful and important witness, of course, in the trial of Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis yesterday. Another key witness yesterday at the Derek Chauvin trial was the doctor who pronounced George Floyd dead. He said the, that lack of oxygen was a likely cause. And he was there to disprove the lie that many uh, on the right and in conservative media are saying uh, it was not the cause of death, that, that the cop's knee was on his neck, that it must have been drugs or something else. Here's Dr. Brandon Langenfield's testimony. Did they say to you for purposes of caring or giving treatment to Mr. Floyd that they felt he had uh, suffered a drug overdose? Not in the information they gave, no. Did they tell you in the information they gave uh, that they felt that Mr. Floyd had had a heart attack? No. Was your leading theory then for the cause of Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest oxygen, oxygen deficiency? That was one of the more likely possibilities. I felt that at the time, based on the information I had, it was more likely than the other possibilities. All right. Other things happened in the last 24 hours. Other things were said and other things occurred. But I'm uh, out of time for those. I'll give you what's left. It's not COVID. It's not politics. It's time for the news dump. Farmers flock of sheep roaming with their woolly rumps. The plotting insurrection on today's news dump. <laughs> Wow, uh, the farmer sheep are planning an insurrection. Another great news dump jingle from Pete Code. I already played that one, Pete. I need more news dumps. If you get a jingle, send it my way. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. Okay, how about this? Let's start in the air where a former Southwest Airline pilot has been charged in Maryland for committing a lewd, indecent, or obscene act after allegedly exposing his genitals while in flight. From Philadelphia to Orlando, yeah. A spokesperson for Southwest told the Associated Press that the incident, alleged to have occurred last August, was not witnessed by any passengers. Hmm. On or about August 10th, on the aircraft, where this guy was in command, intentionally committed an act of lewd, indecent, and obscene exposure of genitals in a public place. Remember when the pilot could just take his balls out and do a ball walk, just leave his, his, his scrotum outside of his... Uh, zipper and walk around. Ah, oh, those were the good old days. Ah, I wish we could get back to them. Gross. 
I'm following the story down in Florida, Manatee County, to be uh, specific. Uh, a re- it's still under a state of emergency as of Sunday. Federal, state, and local officials work to control a leak at a former phosphate processing plant threatened to contaminate the area with millions of gallons of polluted water. A worst-case scenario could send 20 feet of contaminated water flooding from the site. Terrible situation in Florida. A total breach that spurts out uncontrolled water could also destabilize gypsum stacks containing radioactive material. Yeah, NPR is reporting emergency crews are using pumps and vacuum trucks to drain a leaking wastewater reservoir in an effort to prevent a full-fledged breach that officials said could unleash a 20-foot wall of water. Well, I'm sure Governor DeSantis has got it all under control. And file this under... Movies I'm never probably going to watch, but Godzilla vs. Kong earned about $48.5 million in the U.S. last week, the strongest box office performance of the pandemic by far, and a sign that Americans are eager to return to the movie theaters. Uh, Speaking of movies, Netflix lost 31% of its market share in the last year as streaming rivals gained ground. Um, We're talking about Disney, Apple TV, Paramount, and more. Stanford won the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship over Arizona, the team's first title since 1992. And last night in the men's championship, Baylor of Texas absolutely shellacked Gonzaga of Spokane, Washington in the men's NCAA Basketball Championship. And finally, in international news dumping, North Korea, citing the pandemic, will skip the Tokyo Olympics. 27 people died as a cargo ship collided with a ferry in Bangladesh. Myanmar's security forces have killed hundreds of civilians since the February military coup. At least 40 killed were children. Nearly 2,000 prisoners escaped to jail in the southeast Nigeria. And there's violence in Northern Ireland. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your news dump. Now it is time to get to my first guest. She and I go pretty far back because we met and worked together at CNN for a few years. I became good friends with she and her husband, John Avalon, who are both CNN commentators. We became even closer when we started, when we became colleagues at the launch of the Insight Channel that I created at SiriusXM, where I worked hard to advocate to give a show to her. She is the host of WNET's Firing Line. She's a best selling author. Her writings appeared in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Daily News, Daily Beast, CNN.com. She served on the staffs of the White House under President George W. Bush, as well as Department of Homeland Security on Capitol Hill and on two presidential campaigns. She's the president of American Unity Fund and works to advance full political equality for LGBT Americans. And I'm very happy to have my old friend Margaret Hoover on Stand Up with Pete Dominic podcast for the first time. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is for the first time on the podcast. My old friend, a woman I admire and like so much and her whole family, Margaret Hoover. Hi. Hi, Pete Dominic. So fun to talk to you again. I wanted to ask you first here on the record to share your pandemic experience. You and your husband, John Avalon, have two young kids, a boy and a girl, and How have you guys been such busy professionals? Everybody sees you guys on TV all the time, on CNN, on your show, of course, Firing Line. Uh, How have you guys navigated this with young kids? I mean, it's been crazy like everybody else who's had kids at home, right? And our kids have been home for the whole year. um, And, you know, it's just so interesting to think, like, I'm sitting here in this chair, which is in a room that used to be a guest bedroom in this teeny sort of cottage that we have in Long Island where we used to come on weekends where we came last March and we got rid of the bed in here and turned it into a makeshift office so that we could have a space to work and I'm looking out the window and the flowers are blooming again and it looks exactly like it did today a year ago Mm. except for that the world was dark and crazy and we had no idea what was around the corner and it was just madness And and it was terrifying right the markets were shut down everything was shut down And the future was incredibly uncertain. Of course, you know, the reality is that the future is always uncertain. But I don't know, sitting here looking out the same window a year later, um, it's it's remarkable to think through we've done a year of the totally unimaginable, like living at home, working from home, kids at home, uh, (laughs) living in a very small weekend (laughs) hideaway for a year. (laughs) Um, 
And so, I mean, I think like everybody, it's had moments of pure joy and delight and grace. Um, it's been, you know, so much of a blessing to have all this time that we never would have had otherwise. Like truly, we just, all the moments, For sure. many, many of the moments are things we would never have remembered or we would never, we just purely, truly, genuinely would have never had. We were too busy. We were flying everywhere or running around everywhere and I just, or too tired. I mean, I'm still too tired. Um, but, um, you know, but in all the madness and the upheaval is still, you know, you're still constantly stretching um, and it's, and it's uncomfortable um, even though we've been healthy and we've been, right. you know, very lucky. Um, so we're like, we're, we're the blessed one. Like we're super blessed um, and we don't take that for granted. Um, you know, we got lucky on the early, on the front end of this, you know, a lot of people just, you know, walk, you know, got COVID by doing their daily life. Right. Like, and if you were able to skip that first wave and then hunker down, yep. you know, there, there were ways to avoid it. And we got lucky in that first wave because we were in Manhattan. We could have very easily been at any one of those events that turned into super spreader events. We just, you know, luckily didn't and then hunkered down and, uh, so look, we have, we have nothing to complain about, but that doesn't mean that even, I think like most people, Pete, who, who've had a pretty easy run of it, relatively speaking, doesn't, doesn't mean we haven't had to stretch, you know, and, uh, and parts of it haven't been uncomfortable. And, but it's, again, it's all relative and it's crazy. Our kids are a year older, you know, did you they, know, did, did they miss out on anything significantly that they know of that they're cognizant? How old are they now? Seven and five. Yeah, so they so they, went, they know they went what, from six to seven to to four to five. They know what nor the normal times in a normal uh, life is, if you will, that you guys created for them. And and was it? Did they struggle? The kids have actually done remarkably well. My Good. daughter, the four to five year old, has blossomed because she had so much more time with her parents who were gone all the time. Wonderful. Were busy or Wonderful. Were working, and so in that way, I actually I dread to think of what would have happened if this hadn't happened to us. Like, huh. You know, we were imposed upon our children in a way we should have been in the first place. I mean, as a <clears throat> as a mother, it makes me quite sad to think about like, oh, I did not have that balance right. <laughs> um, mm. And having a, a different balance forced upon me actually, I think, improved my daughter for the for the better. And uh, it makes me, you know, upset to think about. Um, but I'm very grateful, like deeply grateful. Um, well, I'm, much better. I'm so glad to hear all of that. That's such great news. And now I want to ask you about other things that are news uh, that you have been covering, of course, on your excellent program, Firing Line. You just had uh, I've been watching several of the interviews the whole time you've been doing it, but just it, gearing up to talk with you today. And your most recent, I think it is with David from and Ann Applebaum is fantastic because it's really where I wanted to start with you about the future of the Republican Party. You are a person that gets asked that a lot, primarily often, of course, being given your background, but you are the one asking that to both of these experts and really people who have a lot of history behind them or historical historical expertise. So your answer first, I mean, before you ask them, I'm sure you, you maybe it's influenced by uh, talking to folks like them, I'm sure. But where do you think the Republican Party is, by the way, three months since Insurrection Day, if you want to call it that? I mean, in, in, I think there are two ways to look at the Republican. There's, a, there's more than one way to look at of the course. Republican Party. If you just look at the federal government, you've got the Republicans in the House and the Republicans in the Senate. And the Republicans in the House, I think, are far worse off, in some ways even worse than the immediate aftermath of the insurrection and, and the election. You know, I was of the naive view that if Trump won, I'm sorry, rather, if, if President Trump lost the election and then eventually left, the Republican Party would be in, a, in at least in a decent position to begin building back. Hmm. And I what I didn't realize um, partly because of my own naivete and partly because I was so dis disheartened by the ugliness of the Trump years that I couldn't always bring myself to listen to all the words he was saying. Right? It was just, <laughs> it yeah. was just so yeah. hard. Well, right. And yeah. I just couldn't force myself to listen to every single line of every single rally throughout the course of, but if I had been listening closer, I would have, I would not have been surprised that uh, QAnon was so infested 
in the base of the Republican Party and mm. the conspiracy theories and the paranoid style of American politics and the ugliness was just, you know, if you take Trump away from that, you still have all the rot. The rot's still there. And and in some ways that rot just continues to to promulgate and kind of sort of foam beneath the surface. And it's it's just still sort of lathering around in the House of Representatives. And the leadership in the House of Representatives amongst the Republicans just doesn't know what to do with it. They're scared of it. They're not leaders. Um, they're politically hungry opportunists that don't have moral courage, with the exception of 10 Republicans who voted to impeach. Uh, and, you know, so so it's very disheartening um, if you look at the Republican Party in the House of Representatives. There's there's not a very bright future at all. So that's um, those are the elected House Republicans. And I guess you mentioned, you know, the, the issue with QAnon and conflation. And so what what is the uh, the other the few? Senate, way, yeah. in, it, well, in, in Senate, the, in the Senate, you have, you know, seven way more than I expected uh, Republicans who voted to convict. You have far more that would have been willing to if there had just been a critical mass. You know, if there had been that 17 willing to hold hands and jump together, they could have done it. Um, but, you know, so so for elected Republicans in this at the federal level, um, there's just a couple of silver linings, you know, between Mitt Romney and and the others who voted to convict in the Senate. Um, and then at the state level, you've got you still have some governors. They're not paying attention. I mean, what's happening now is that nobody's listening to Trump. His influence is waning. Uh, Are you it sure? Really is. Yep. I am. I, 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 I was so sure that when the, you, you look at the governors, yep. you look at the governors, they're mm-hmm. not paying attention to him. They don't care about him. Their election doesn't depend on him, not one way or the other. And so you've got, I mean, the, the really good ones like Larry Hogan in Maryland, who, are, you know, who's always been. Margaret, I, I totally agree with you that his, his influence is waning, but I wonder if your Kemp's and your DeSantis and maybe there's others, uh, what's her name, I think in North Dakota, are trying to be him, which is different than his influence, but trying to be him or copy him or or maybe that's not ever a fair comparison because there's only one Trump. Sorry to interrupt you, but are any... Christy, no, no, I think that's a fair pushback. Uh, the, um, you, know, you do have to look at that next class. So another way of Republicans, you're the governors in the states who aren't paying attention to Trump, but what they are paying attention to is 2024. And the ambitious ones want to be president next. And so they're trying to take the notes from him that, that they think are going to work for them. You see that in DeSantis. I don't think Christy Nome wants to be president from South Dakota. You mentioned her, uh, too. Yeah. Yep. Um, but then you've got, you know, you do have this whole class of future candidates that are absolutely trying to get headlines and jockey and, you know, but nobody's actually trying to replicate Trump. Exactly. Um, can't be I done. There, I think that's I think there's a recognition or realization that can't be done. And then yeah. there's varying competing forms of. But can you have Trumpism without Trump? And, you know, and can you have like a more sophisticated veneer of Trumpism without Trump? Um, and, and that's what the Tom Cotton's, the Rick Scott's, the Ron DeSantis is, right? Tom Cotton, our senator from Arkansas, uh, Ron DeSantis, the governor from Florida, Rick Scott, the senator from Florida, um, and I would say a handful of others, Mike Pompeo. Um, Ted Cruz? Ted Cruz, for sure. Lindsey Graham. Although, Lindsey Graham, absolutely. You know, they're they're all trying to take the, the bit of Trump that they think they can carry with them and <laughs> that can appeal uh, that that but that kind of hot, make it a hybrid them that Trumpism sort of meshed with their own record or s- personal style um, or political philosophy. You know how you'll know if they're really trying is the first one who who like goes to a tanning salon or paints their skin a little bit orange. Like they're really like they wouldn't put it past Ted Cruz. All of a sudden he's really trying to look like <laughs> his hair becomes kind of blonde. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he bleaches like his like hair a little dried. bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so, so I, think, I think all that said, if I were just going to put a cap on it, look, the Republican Party is in bad shape. It's in very bad shape. Uh, and it's and it's uh, in worse shape than I thought it would be. Um, but, you know, the the, the, the silver, the, the, the bright spots of which there are a few are the ones that I'm kind of hanging, hanging, not hanging my hat on, but really choosing to try to bolster and buttress. Uh, because they're the ones I do think it is important for the party to have a strong or for the country to have a strong center right party. Um, and, and, and the people that I think best embody that, at least in the context of our fight against authoritarianism and our fight for democracy, um, have to be supported, absolutely have to be supported. And so that's I'm looking at the next two years as how do you make sure every single one of those Republicans who voted to impeach in the House of Representatives gets elected? How do we get rid of some of the really wicked Republicans? I mean, wicked like Marjorie Taylor Greens and Lauren Boebert mm. and Andy Biggs and Gozart, um, Paul Gozart. And, Mo, you know, like there's just some some really wicked ones that need to be punished. And 
And so that that's what I'm sort of focusing my short term effort on um, behind the scenes, uh, because because I, I, I think we, we have to have a party that stands for the that actually stands for the Constitution. Does it just say so? Well, yeah, but I, I, I wonder if <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I can like they do just on the radio, like those constitutionalists on the radio or, you know, I learned they learned about the history of the United States Constitution, constitutional law from Mark Levin, who is, you know, or Rush Limbaugh, who just shorthanded all day long. But I, I wonder if the issue, especially given, you know, the at least releases from Boehner's book, are you are you trying to get him on firing line? Are you uh, yeah. do I have yeah, an exclusive working on it, working on it, because working on it. I'd love to see you talk with him. He would be a great Me interview. Too. Me but too. but the the issue that he is saying to some extent, he's saying a lot and the way I'm looking at the modern Republican Party or what would be the center right party. And some of this is influenced from watching firing line and hearing, I think, David Frum mentioned H.W. Bush is the the litmus or the threshold of Republicans who believe in 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 government and government serving a purpose versus as Boehner talks about these just they're people that are just trying to get attention and they're just bizarre performers and they're. Uh, trying to get you know commentator deals or sell books and so on. They have no interest in get famous, right? But they don't care about government functioning. They're there to actually destroy. Like, is that a fair way to describe the you know? What... I think that's a that's a. I think that accurately describes a big a big at least sixty of Republicans in the House of Representatives, right? Like, hmm. if you just think if you just take the House the Republicans in the House of Representatives, what do you have? You have a, how many of them are there? There's about a hundred and. 70 right now is that about right you're making you're forcing me to to google look there's a 60 of them didn't vote for liz cheney voted for liz cheney to get kicked off her committee assignments right or did right there was a (laughs) right and that was by the way that was the secret ballot okay so uh, that's such uh, a good point such a good point and such a great measurement of their kind of views crazy caucus you've got 60 that are in the crazy caucus and to and 11 Republicans to 11, 211. So then 60 are in the crazy caucus. Another mm-hmm. 60 pretend to be crazy. Right. Because they're afraid. <laughs> how do you know the difference? That's so right, too. Yes. I wonder right? how you because know the difference afraid to be held accountable by their electorate for not being crazy enough. Right. But right. They are smarter than that. They're smarter than the. Crazy right. Crazy. Right. So that gets you to 120. And then, you know, and the rest are sort of just varying degrees of that. And then, you know, and then you've got like 10 to 20 good guys. Like, where would you put? Guys, where would you put that beautiful boy, Madison Cawthorn? Oh, he's gorgeous. Oh man, he's in. He's in the crazy caucus. He's crazy, he's, right? He's, he's right nuts. And by the way, he doesn't even take a secret ballot. Like, oh god, he's the worst. Yeah, no, it's really too bad. Okay, so yeah, though, that's the way. That's a really interesting way of looking at today's Republican Party in terms of of, of how they are are made up and whether or not Trump's influence is is waning or not. How do you look at now? Where are we? Did I say three months? How did you view the insurrection, the attack on the Capitol when it happened? Were you just stunned, shocked, unsurprised? I mean, how did you feel about it? How do you think about it? And you've seen this Reuters poll today about a huge percentage of registered Republicans or people identify as Republicans think that it was still think that it was mostly peaceful and or weren't Trump supporters. Yeah, Uh at the day, uh, on the day of the 6th, I was, I was shocked. Um, my husband had sort of prophetically said, you know what, I just, I want to stick around on the 6th and that we were going to take a, we were going to go down to South Carolina to see his parents. We had to quarantine and test and then drive down and hunker down there just so we could see his parents. Because we, of course, like most people, we hadn't seen people's families in a long time mm-hmm. this Christmas with our families. So we, we were planning to go down to South Carolina to spend time with his parents, also help them get their vaccinations. And he said, you know, we should just stick around for the six because that's when they're going to certify the electors. And I just feel like that could be a a, a wild day, like a sort of politically wild day yeah. in his story. But he he didn't think it would be violent, uh, but he thought it, there could be activity. Right. But he'd, he'd also, unlike me, been listening to every single thing all the people have been saying. Um, and I mean, if you were listening to more those seriously than I was, if you were listening, yeah, you knew. The, the, like, well, if you were listening to the conspiracy theories, you definitely knew. Like, I there's these guys that host a podcast about now it's become very big about QAnon. They cover QAnon. And if you had been listening to the the crazies, you, you they were talking about those dates. But I mean, yeah. most people weren't looking at the the dark web. So no, 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 no. And, and but I, I was I was um, I, I, I don't even know how to characterize how deeply really like devastated for our country i was Mm. um and and devastated for um yeah for the country and for you know the families the the people that work 
hurt um, how close of a call it was with some of our electeds. Um, truly, in terms of their lives, um, seeing the noose on the Capitol, on the lawn of the in front of the Capitol, which I just I'm still so deeply uh, demoralized and and kind of devastated that th- this happened in our country. How do you feel about people like Senator uh, Hawley and Senator Cruz, who were very encouraging uh, uh, of those guys, and some people blamed them and others who really spread the lie? Because I have sympathy for those. The Capitol rioters, uh, I have a certain sympathy for them, because if I believed that my vote was stolen and that the election was stolen, I, I would I actually would endorse violence, I think. Yeah, no, no, no. That's the thing. It's like if you are. But but for to, to extend your point, if you are part of perpetuating that lie, if you are the people who believe the leaders who told you it was stolen and told you yeah. that it was your right and responsibility to fight for freedom by storming the Capitol. Um, I think they deserve to be kicked out of the Senate. Yeah. I, I think their, their yeah. peers well, at owe, least. It, owe, owe it to the to the body and to the institution to expel them from the Senate. Well, they if you're do gonna, not deserve yeah. to be U.S. senators. If you're going to reestablish, you know, some kind of agreed upon truth, you would have to sanction people who were, were not spreading the truth, but they don't necessarily apparently you know, want to uh, agree on that. But my, my sympathy for them is the president of the United States. It wasn't like Rush Limbaugh or Mark Levin or Sean Hannity was telling them they all were. The president yeah. was telling them over and yeah. over that the election was stolen from them. And I remember when they were going to try to steal, you know, the Detroit votes, it, those Republicans in, in, in Michigan. Yeah. I was read. I had a pitchfork. I mean, I wasn't going to actually leave the shed, Margaret. I was I would have talked to big, uh, big game, though, here in my my podcast. I mean, it's outrageous. It, it, it's true. I mean, if you if you and this is I mean, it, which obviously gets to the larger problem about the, you know, how fractionalized or, or, or factionalized and fragmented the media is and, and sources yeah, of information yep. or disinformation and how powerful that is. But if you believe that disinformation and you believe it is true, you know, you can see a clear line of logic. These people were acting in accordance with their their beliefs and their views. And they were in their own way, morally courageous. Um even though they what even though they were actually fun breaking the law. I mean, they're breaking the law and they're invading the cat. I mean, that's crazy. But they but they believed that the American, you know, the American promise was being stolen right out from under them. I want to ask you about what is happening right now in, in Georgia, specifically in terms of the the the, the corporations, MLB uh, taking the the all star game out of there. Can I just can I just put in a small footnote on what I just said though? I'm so sorry, because I want to go to MLB. These people believed in the lie. On the other hand, many of them didn't even vote. So, many well, of maybe because they thought this. their you vote. You, I'm going to be. I mean, well, I'm bending over like, backwards like, for, really for believe, the white Did they pants. really believe? I know. Did they really believe that the the Constitution was being stolen from them? They didn't even bother to exercise their their uh, you know their privilege. I mean, vote, if you looked right, at the responsibility I, vote. You know so, yeah, why I think they do? Them too much you know, they're vandalizing the Capitol. I, I am know. giving them too much credit. Anybody can make that argument and they would be right. I'll just never forget the the, the cover of the Sunday Times magazine because I get it because I'm an elite. And it they just copy and pasted all of Trump's tweets before the election saying the election was going to be fraudulent. Yeah, It was so many messages so often telling these people, don't even waste your time. Going to but vote. He did the same tr- thing the first time around. He did the same thing. Yeah, first of course time he did. He's and a, he was like, oh. but, but well, yeah. Is like what a what a sort of a spiritual leader he's become. Sure. For for a certain group of people, and it's absolutely really just what he says. Uh, yes, you know, they're imp- it, There's no fact. There's no truth. There's no. It's not that they're. Imp- I, I was thinking this about asking you this, but we're almost out of time. I want to ask you about that boycott thing. I was thinking about how these people aren't impervious to reason. They're not hearing the arguments. <laughs> they're not hearing them. For a lot of people, the message is never getting to them that would, if maybe, makes make some sense. They don't hear it. They're so in a bubble and listening. That's my view on at least some of them. Let me ask you about yeah. the, uh, the the boycotts, because I think it's interesting. Yesterday, we took the, the girls to Hershey Park. Have you ever been there? The roller coaster I place? Haven't. And, I haven't. And our, I, I've heard of it. I'm familiar with it. it was like our I'd first like t- to take my kids. It was like our first time out in, in a hotel in a year. And it was awesome. But they had a Chick-fil-A there. And the girls really wanted to go there. And I was telling them about the history there about um the controversy where they're because it was closed we were there on sunday like oh my god it's closed i was like oh yeah that's because their ownership and we got into it but my point here is corporations are always going to do what they think is in their best interest to make money their pr people are crafting a message and 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 they go whatever wherever they think they can make money mlb coca-cola uh delta airlines whatever it is 
And I'm just thinking about Chick-fil-A. They stuck to their guns on their anti-gay stuff and they won. Right. Do I have that right? You you have been a civil rights leader on this issue. I don't know if you remember that specific issue, but yeah, no, I remember it. Look, they didn't. I mean, they just didn't. They just they they still made more. They might have made arguably more money. They decided not to give same sex partnership benefits or they decided they weren't going to they they made a statement about marriage equality. They didn't believe in. They believe marriage was traditional. I, I actually don't remember exactly what the my argument is it that was around they, the time of the same sex marriage fights. And you know what? They decided to plant a flag in the culture wars. And you're right. They didn't they weren't penalized for it. They might have arguably my my recollection was they made more money. Or at least they said they did. I don't know. The lines are like, by the way, their chicken sandwiches are very popular. So it might just be like sometimes people that. <laughs> That eat chicken sandwiches at Chick Fil A might not care that much. They might like their chicken sandwich more than the point is. All right. So, what do you think about MLB leaving? What do you think about these corporations and what is being called cancel culture, but what has always been called uh, as boycotts or you know, it's corporations. What What are your thoughts? Well, the corporations or or the specific law in Georgia. Well, let's go to the law in Georgia first. You had a great interview with Stacey Abrams shortly after she lost to Brian Kemp in 2019. I highly recommend any listener go back and, and, and get that for some historical. She wouldn't concede because she thought he cheated then on your show on Firing Line. So what are your thoughts she, on these? She wouldn't concede, but she did acknowledge that she wouldn't be the governor. I mean, it, it was actually sorry. I mean, it, was, it sounds a lot like the, the current situation without the violence, right? Like, I mean, Donald Trump did leave. Uh, but she, but she really truly believes that the difference in the votes was because of the, the history of voter suppression. And you know what? There's um, enough voter suppression, enough history of voter suppression in, in Georgia that um, you know one can certainly applaud her for going forward to make sure that same thing didn't happen four years later, two years later, four years later. And uh, I think she's probably gearing up to run for governor. And I think that's the one job she wants. You know, she could have run for Senate if she wanted to, but she hasn't wanted. I don't think she wants to be a senator. I think she wants to be the governor of Georgia. And hmm. um, it goes back to her very first, you know, her very first interview at, at time as a child when she won a statewide uh, competition. She went to the governor's mansion to receive her award and the guard turned her and her family away because he thought, you know, they were clearly in the wrong place going up to the governor's mansion as a black family. She didn't forget uh, that. Getting off the bus and she's never forgotten it and she can't yeah. wait till it's her house. Um, and, you know, more power to her, I think. So um, so m- my big argument on this is simply, listen, before we get to, you know, people now muddying the waters uh, about certain aspects of the Georgia law, the question has to be, why were new laws made and for our, uh, a problem that didn't exist? That's where I start. Is that a fair place to start? You start even before I that? I think it's I think I think you have to acknowledge all of it. I think you have to acknowledge that the reason. There are a couple reasons new laws were made. New laws were made because there was a big lie, right? There's there's a big lie that uh, Trump actually won the election and it was voter fraud that changed the numbers. And so we have to make new election laws, you know, new laws in Georgia in order to make sure that there's no fraud moving forward. OK, so that's that's one of the reasons you have new laws. But another reason you have new laws is that a lot of things were put in place provisionally during the pandemic. And, yeah, some of them worked. <laughs> Um, and in the, I think it just, I think what's lost a little bit, I think that certain elements of the law, as you said, before we get into the sort of muddy, the waters about the specifics of the law, I actually think the specifics of the law are really important, Pete, because some of the things that came out of the law are things that Stacey Abrams argued need to be out of the law because they do end up suppressing black vote, right? So signature match was taken out of the law. That's a good thing. Um, the, the law is more liberal. In the sense, I mean, in the small, like classical liberal sense, in openness sense, I don't mean in the context of progressive or conservative. Um, but the, the law does have, uh, it opens up voting more than it was opened in the statute in 2019. Okay, there were, there, it is less open than during the pandemic year, but it is more open than during 2019, right? So there are provisions that they actually codified into law that, that they borrowed from this pandemic year. And, and that is a liberalization of the law, too. Now, is it is it the best law that could have been written to enfranchise as many Georgia voters as possible? No, it's not. Um, but I, I it has voter ID in it, doesn't it? it? It it does. But if you actually look at how voter ID worked in Georgia, OK, I'm not talking about voter ID writ large mm-hmm. or how individual municipalities or states across the country apply it. But voter ID in Georgia this last year in 2020 didn't end up turning people away from the polls. More people voted than ever before. And voter ID didn't end up 
turning black and brown voters away from the polls. Like right, but it's not required in Georgia this year. But it's not required. It I don't was understand. required this year. It was no, but it's not. It's required. It's it shouldn't be required. You need. I think a, an ID should be required to register to vote, but not to show up at the library or I go to vote because nobody's cheating there. And if there were in Georgia, yeah. there what 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 the officials say in Georgia is that voter ID didn't. There, there's no evidence that suggests that voter ID turned people away from the polls in any occasion in Georgia in 2020. Um, it does have voter ID in the law, but, but, you know, even if Brad Raffensperger, you know, the hero, the one who told Trump to, that he wasn't yeah. going to go find 11,800 votes for him. He wasn't going to overturn the constitution for him, you know, firmly believes that voter ID was not, was not an impediment to minorities or anybody being able to exercise their, their ability to vote. So, so I think actually the specifics of the Georgia law are really important because I do feel that both sides in this case are, you know, one side is calling this Jim Crow 2.0, the other side is calling this, uh, you know, whatever it's calling it. And in, in both cases, it's actually undermining people's confidence in the law. And the truth is the law is less liberal than 2020, more liberal than 2019. But And so that can't be too, that can't be Jim Crow 2.0. Well, my understanding is that Georgia has, I don't, I, I'm not nearly as read into it as you are, but my understanding is that Georgia before this law limited polling places in black areas they've done everything they can to minimize access for black people do you disagree with that that's no, no i don't of course okay. and there is and by the way by the way you are not wrong and you're you're correct when you call out that there are absolutely nefarious forces in georgia still today that were part of this you know the construction of this bill that we're trying to make it that we're actually trying to make it far worse in the context of voter suppression i mean they were trying to take out you know, the, they call it souls to the polls. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. They voted, right? Yeah, they were trying sure. to keep that out immediately. There was yep. so much backlash that they ended up writing it in. So there are two Sundays, two of the three Sundays leading into the election are you're allowed to vote. And but that, by the way, that wasn't that wasn't part of uh, a part of the law before. So, again, it is this is not a perfect bill. <laughs> this is not a good bill. But it's it's hard to say in the in the areas where it has been liberalized that it's Jim Crow 2.0. Let me ask it, you. That, it, that just feels like too much. But it, even though it's again, it's it's highly imperfect. L- let me ask you before I got to let you go here. Uh, finally, about I just got to get your thoughts on because now nobody's talking about it. But I really want to ask you about Andrew Cuomo. I mean, he's still the governor of New York, even after all these allegations, the scandal surrounding the nursing well, the, home. The, the investigation is still going on. Right? So, all the investigations are still going. So right. I think I mean, I think there's an argument for for not for due process. I mean, there, yep. this is an illegal proceeding, but there is a, a process for figuring out, like, should somebody, you know, are all these allegations true? Should somebody just be sort of defrocked because of allegations mm-hmm. or should, um, or should there be some kind what's of, your, a, what's a your view? I, I, and a yeah, what's your... I think there should be some kind, I mean, it should, the mob shouldn't rule, right. right? We should have cooler arms about us, but we should, but there should a thousand percent be accountability, right? Like you, you, these leaders have to be accountable for their actions. I mean, of course, in the, in the context of Cuomo, <laughs> Some things are more believable uh, than others about certain leaders. Um, but I think you, you see what we did to James and you see what the, the inquiries reveal. Um, and, and then and then you, you see what he's forced to do. I mean, he's a fighter. We all know he's a fighter. Um, but if, if he has treated these women as inappropriately, as, as I'm actually say, more worried about the uh, nursing home scandal. I mean, nursing homes. Well, I mean, that led to more deaths, certainly, um, and probably is worse. Um, but taken together, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand how he thinks he's going to run for a fourth term. I just don't. Well, he's got, he seemed to have, (laughs) he doesn't have a lot of support or a lot of love either. I I feel like he does. I feel like he has not lost like two thirds of Democrats in the state who are telling him to step down immediately. Yeah. And his two two senators of of New York. Two thirds of Democrats in the state that might have a short memory, uh, based on the economy and everything. Um, Matt Gaetz, do you have any time to say anything about him? What that whole controversy is? I haven't been paying. Oh my gosh. It seems like oh, it gets too much oh, attention, just, but I don't know. He's one of the wicked ones. He's one of the wicked ones. Oh, yeah. You know, he's in your. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's good one point. of my wicked Republicans. Who, yeah. You know what? Like. Should have mentioned uh, him then. Yeah. I, I'm delighted that he is imploding publicly. And I, I want to <laughs> I wanna help that process along as okay. quickly and fast as I can. I want to make sure that that seat is not held by him come 2022. Great to talk to you. I'm so happy that you uh, joined me here on the podcast. And it's so Thanks great to hear your me. voice. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me, Margaret. All right. Take good care. There she goes. Margaret Hoover. Follow her on Twitter and Instagram. Tell her you heard her here on Stand Up. Obviously, Margaret and I don't always see eye to eye on things, on all things. Never have. Uh, That's usually the case with a lot of my guests. Certainly, 
Uh, a lot of people are making the point that she made, uh, make the, uh, many of the points that she made about the, the Georgia laws, and clearly I, I disagree with that. Others uh, like her saying that it's too hyperbolic to compare them, uh, to call them the new Jim Crow. I, I just I disagree, obviously, but I loved catching up with and reconnecting with Margaret. Great to have her point of view on the show, and I am uh, excited to welcome other new guests. Who should I have on? You can always suggest guest ideas. Just put guest ideas in the subject to standupwithpeat at gmail.com. And now we turn to one of your all-time favorites, a regular here on Stand Up. He has a regular column at Bloomberg News, where he also hosts the podcast Masters in Business. He wrote an amazing book that he references in this upcoming interview called Bailout Nation. Read his very popular blog and subscribe to his daily news articles, Morning Reads, and uh, The Big Picture, which is Ritholtz.com. And here is my latest with Barry Ritholtz, who on Twitter, by the way, always great, at Ritholtz. Ladies and gentlemen, there he is, at Ritholtz, Barry Ritholtz, joining me to talk about his latest articles at the Bloomberg podcast set the masters in the business and of course everything he is posting on the blog <laughs> and everywhere else hello sir how do how are you i'm good i'm good i'm uh, i'm happy to see you i'm happy to be in conversation with you there are several things i want to talk about but uh first and foremost i really wanted to reach out to you to talk about this infrastructure bill and this other government spending and how right now we're hearing the argument uh be laid out that we can't afford this to be paid for with tax increases on the wealthiest individuals and corporations. And my simple premise is if you spend a billions and billions of dollars on infrastructure, you're creating millions and millions of jobs. So even if it were true that tax uh, increases were going to kill jobs somehow, it wouldn't matter because you're creating so many with the spending. Is it much more complex than that? Um, there, you know, it, it's like the blind man describing the, the elephant. Everybody is looking at a different part and describing it differently. Look, the, the, the first question is there always seems to be money for, um, wars or tax cuts and we don't fund those so that you could deficit spend forever. But simple stuff like why are the roads in America embarrassing? Why are bridges collapsing? So I, I had to stop myself over the weekend. Some, some, um, you get mad at all my curses. Some, some shit for brains says, you know, the infrastructure of the United States really isn't that bad. That's like spoken like a person who's never left the United States. Hmm. Go to Asia, go to Europe, and you'll say, holy fuck, is that what a highway is supposed to look like? You mean smooth as glass and well-lit and well-maintained and not sort of this half-assed, patched-over disaster that costs Americans thousands of dollars a year in automobile repairs and delays? But that's just me. So I, I kind of— throttle it back and, and the other, just try, try the and other, have a relaxing weekend. You, you constantly hear the critics of tax increases who seemingly are always wrong with their predictions, but it doesn't matter, uh, saying that raising taxes will kill jobs or that we pay the highest taxes in the world. But the course, the flip side is that a lot of corporations, though they're First of all, we don't pay the highest taxes in the world by a, a, by a stretch. Not even remotely, and, but we, they don't pay them, even though they we, might be we at a... Uh, like a multi-decade low in taxes, a trend that goes back to the early 80s. Mm -hmm. So it's it's legitimately been 40 years of of tax cuts and deficits. And all my literally my entire adult career, all I have heard is this is going to cause big deficits. It's going to debase the dollar. It's going to cause hyperinflation. It's going to crowd out private investing. If you deficit spends, you are fucked. And the problem with being the boy who called cried wolf is at a certain point, and I think the Biden administration is that point, people just become completely inured to it and say, hey, you, you've been crying wolf now for decades. And it's bad enough that all the things you keep warning about don't happen. But as soon as you're back in power, you start deficit spending. If you had to guess who was the bigger deficit spenders, would it be the Republicans or the Democrats? The Republicans cut taxes and start wars. The Democrats raise taxes and do all sorts of other spending. They're both big deficit producers. 
one side of the argument is just completely hypocritical about it. And it would also seem that whether you ask uh, civil engineers who obviously have a bias because they're going to get right. work. I mean, or, listen, even or, if it's not a D minus, if you've traveled around the country, mm. right? I mean, LaGuardia did not get fixed until then Vice President Biden called it out as a shithole. Mm. I think the exact term was LaGuardia Airport looks like a third world airport. <laughs> and it and it did. Yeah. And now LaGuardia Airport is spectacular. Or said that that's what an American says. What a what a normal person around the world would say is, oh, decent airport. And and I've been to decent airports like Detroit or Tampa. Um but for the most part, they're, they're memorable because they're the exception. Like Detroit was like, wow, what a nice airport for, for Detroit of all things. So we need a lot of infrastructure well, repair. We used to lead the world in this. It was a giant platform that businesses built upon, created jobs, innovation, wealth. And uh, I'm, I'm on a jag already. I'll, I'll stop well, there. Well, I mean, the, the issue is that – we can talk about about the government spending is being targeted for more than just infrastructure. We can talk about how infrastructure is being defined, how they're defining it. But it would seem that I, I've, he I've heard a lot of analysis and it would seem anecdotally, and a lot of people might be surprised by this, but the federal government is radically underfunded from the IRS to the EPA. They actually don't have enough money for federal housing and so many other things to meet their their requirements, right? I mean, the, the I mean the, the it's whole surprising, thing but it's underfunded. The, when there's two things to point out, one is I, I recommend Jesse Eisinger's "The Chicken Shit Club," which um, is all about the purposeful dismantling of the Department of Justice. If you can't win in court, well, win in by lobbying and cutting your opponent's funding. The IRS has been systematically underfunded, again, on purpose. If we can't cut taxes more, well, let's just stop ordering wealthy people, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I mean, this is well documented. This has been discussed by a lot of people who've done all the heavy lifting, done all the research. Um, it's really a half-assed way to run a country. And all the stuff we're talking about all traces back to campaign finance laws. Yeah, yep. And if I was if I was President Biden and I had, you know, 18 months or, tw or 20 months before um, the next election, well, I would not only pass voting rights laws, but I would pass a very aggressive set of rules about campaign finance, full disclosure about everything. There's no hiding. And, you know, in the old days, if you would give money to a politician so they pass legislation for you. That was called corruption. It wasn't called lobbying. Lobbying is a cleaned up word. The Romans would tie you in a sack with a wildcat, cut your nose off, close the sack, and throw it in the river. That was their solution for people who <laughs> who bribed public officials. And, you know, I, I think the Romans were onto something. So the infrastructure bill that we're hearing a lot of talk about, I don't know if You've heard a, a lot about it, but so much of it is traditional infrastructure, they're saying. And the argument is a lot of it is a, is a liberal wish list, which uh, I think there's some accuracy to. And I think that's important because they're talking about funding essential workers, healthcare workers, uh, home housing aides. I mean, this would be a radical expenditure of uh, federal government money. And it would also be a major increase and in fight against things like child poverty and so much more. What do you make of this uh, huge infrastructure bill that is apparently more than just infrastructure? And also Republicans, I think, define infrastructure only as Roads. roadways. Only. Roads, they don't right. care so about stupid. water pipes. So, they don't care about broadband and obvious other infrastructure. And finally, you know, redoing buildings to make them more sustainable, to keep the cold air in, the hot air out. Uh, how, how, is, about, how about to make them safe for s children in schools? So that there is sufficient that too. Um, circulation, because uh, the assumption is, the intelligent assumption is, COVID ain't our first pandemic and it won't be our last pandemic. And so, therefore, one of the things we've learned about uh, how respiratory viruses are spread 
is the particles that hang in the air. So it becomes important to suck that air out of that room and, and not have you walk into a room full of kids and have it be a death trap. So I, I think you could define infrastructure pretty broadly. No one's going to disagree that roads are infrastructure, and that has to include bridges and tunnels. Um, since we are slowly moving towards electric vehicles, there is also so, an argument to be had that uh, electric charging stations is part of our transportation infrastructure. The same is true for ports and airports and waterways and aqueducts, and, and that's all infrastructure. And that's before we get to broadband. I mean, and that's and that's before we get to the electrical grid. I mean, uh, uh, someone, I don't know if you caught Pete Do- um, Pete Dominic. That's me! Pete, Yay! Pete Buttigieg went Love on him. Fox News. Yeah, I did. And they tried to, like, sort of submarine him with a couple of gotcha questions. Yep. And he's like, are you aware of the fact that people in Texas were melting snow in their <laughs> yeah, yeah, bathtub yeah, yeah. in order to be able to flush yeah. their toilet because there was no electric? This is America. Not We're not talking about some third world country. Doesn't that horrify you? Shouldn't the electrical system in Texas work? How can you be against a functional electrical system? And the guy was like, ah, ah, ah. so, so, you know, now is broadband t- truly infrastructure? If you want to order, argue that, hey, broadband is really a form of communication and about. Okay, you can, but but it requires a lot of physical communication mach- infrastructure, electric grid yeah. infrastructure. These are actual uh, pieces of rail. We haven't talked about rail, right? There's, uh, I, know, I haven't read the investment about rail, but I heard something. But you know, Biden is doubling down on you know buses and rails. I was like, really? I mean, I I wish that people that would be a, an option for transportation for more people, but it seems like a lot of people. All right, I look look down on buses. I, I'm uh, I'm getting an electric uh, sky taxi to go back and forth to the office. Oh well, that's I mean, that's, I'm that's excited about not that. surprising from your yeah, uh, so view. That's uh, anything that tra- flies, goes through water, ground, a- any form of transportation. It doesn't even need an internal combustion engine as long as it just goes. I- I'm I'm an early adopter. So lots more to talk with you about, including uh, b- besides just infrastructure. Do you think that, by the way, have you looked at the politics? I think it might pass. I think they're going to pass at least something. Uh, I think it's going to pass. Substan- so here, here's the, the trade off. You know, when it's 50, everybody has the opportunity to either be, hey, we're supporting you. Whatever you want to do, we're going to stand up with you. We're going to vote for, with you. Or I have some real hesitation on this bill. And I need a little a little taste right. in order to win when it's my fifty vote. senators, right? Yeah. So what's been taking place for the most part has been we're all in, even people like Joe Manchin who have arguably been against ending the filibuster and doing some other stuff. I, I got to give Biden credit. Instead of saying the filibuster is not in the Constitution, this is bullshit, and the Republicans. You know, when they had a chance to throw away the filibuster to jam in some Supreme Court justices, they did it. Why would you think they wouldn't do it when they get control? So please don't tell me this is the nuclear option. They've already used the nuclear right, option. Right, right. Um, but I thought it was very clever of Biden to say, hey, when I got to the Senate, if you wanted the filibuster, you literally had a filibuster. You had to stand up in the well of the Senate and talk sort of Jimmy Stewart style until – you you collapse uh, after 40 hours. That's a filibuster, not just taking a yellow post-it and sticking it on a piece of paper and say filibuster. That's that's nonsense. Also, so, so did, good on good for him to approaching it intelligently. Did, have you heard? I feel like we've ta- talked about this before. Uh, you just mentioned, I think, references to some extent, but technically the, the, that's called earmarks. And after a 10 year hiatus, apparently earmarks are coming back. To the United yeah, States Congress, which that, is... Uh, I don't know if we talked about that recently. I, I, I don't know the latest state of that. After 10-year hiatus, earmarks are coming back to the U.S. Congress. Democrats and Republicans alike repudiated the practice of letting congressmen direct federal spending to specific projects and enterprises around the start of Barack Obama's administration. Now both parties have decided to revive it with reforms. You know, really, really, I like the idea of like a negotiated... Hey, you want my vote? Here's what I'm willing to offer. That's a different story than, 
I'm just going to put a post it and say, if you don't spend X in my district, I'm not voting for it. All right. So also wanted to talk with you about housing. And that's a really interesting it's a bubble. It's, it's well, a bubble. you've got a great, no, it's a bubble. <laughs> you've got a great piece. Uh, this is at the bloggers is at Bloomberg. I listened on that cool that app was the where blog. you can, you can listen now. God, uh, title that was, that was a quick blog post. Cause I've been, you know, at a certain point it's like, really, do I have to repeat this shit again? All right. Well, I mean, you have to repeat it because, uh, what we're seeing in the housing market, I think is worth talking about last yeah. week, the wall street journal, uh, said there are more real estate agents than homes for sale in the U.S. And you broke that down in your latest blog piece, or not latest, but one of your most recent, not a housing bubble. So right. we're not seeing a housing bubble, even though uh, it seems like our housing, the, the market's going crazy. So first of all, the market's not going crazy. You, you have a couple of things happening all at once, which to the uninitiated give the appearance of a little craziness, but... You know, anybody who lived through 02 to 07 knows what a crazy real estate market looks like. And the reality is uh, real estate is a side hustle for a lot of people. Number of states, you don't even need to take a test. So saying you're a real estate agent doesn't really cost you anything. You register with the state, bang, you're a real estate agent. That's not the same as I'm a full-time real estate agent and I'm selling six houses a week. That's a different situation. So so there's that's number one. Number two, you had a situation over the past year where all these folks who lived in cities who by their very nature you are giving up some elbow space and some room in exchange for being in a cosmopolitan locus of culture and museums and restaurants and theater and you know all the things that cities are attractive for so you have the expense of small apartment, but you have none of the upside. And so lots of people who could afford to do this said, you know what, I'm going to go buy a place in the burbs. And this way I will end up not murdering my wife and children <laughs> who are under my foot. Cons I'm trying to do my job. The wife is doing her thing in the next room. The kids are in school. We don't have enough bandwidth. We don't have enough room. And, uh, and so whoever right. could buy a house, buy right. a house. Now, the problem with that is that – there isn't a whole lot of supply, right? There's not a lot of houses for sale. So whatever shows up that's half decent for sale, the buyers overwhelm, you know. If you're buying a house with a 30-year mortgage, let's be honest, the difference between six hundred dollars and $650,000, while it sounds like a lot of money, it's not. It's like $27 on your monthly mortgage. And if you really – or or – something along those lines. And if you really are looking for a space to get the hell out of Brooklyn or Chicago, wherever, where you have a little breathing room, they didn't care. They wanted out and they got out. So, so plus there's just been an incredibly limited amount of inventory. I mean, right. the chart I showed on the blog post was from Len Kiefer. He's the deputy chief economist at, um, is it Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae? I think it's Freddie Mac. It's one of the big mortgage. And he showed the inventory for sale is- Freddie Mac, according uh, to your article. Is at like 30 year lows. I mean, you've, this is, you've never had this little inventory available for sale. That, that's telling, that, that's important because it provides context. You know, prices go up in one of two ways. Either people bid the prices up, and that certainly happens, or there's not enough supply. It's a classic supply and demand right, argument. Right. Here we have both. You have a sudden uptick in demand from people who weren't planning on moving to the suburbs and buying a house. They were very happily either renting or living in their condo in the city. So suddenly, so how many people live in live in cities have enough cash that on a lark, they could go buy a half a million or a million dollar house. Here's a hundred thousand dollars down and a, and a mortgage. And so you're not talking about a lot, but you, that's the thing when you have a fairly balanced supply demand equation, it just takes a little bit of weight on one side of the scale to send things a bit out of whack. Then you combine that with how little um, supply there's been, and it really collapsed in 2020 for obvious reasons. It's very hard to show your house when you might be having someone come in who's going to kill you, which reminds me of a very funny story. Wait, what are you saying? It, it, 
like you don't want a bunch of people who may be COVID positive traipsing oh, oh, through got it. your I'm house. Sorry. Yeah, I'm got. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't you, think of that. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, wait, what is that? There so a... <laughs> naturally, naturally, <laughs> so, is there a murder, so, murder epidemic so, with people so, looking so at houses. What made me laugh is so my mom was a real estate agent, and I heard real estate stories my my whole life, mm-hmm. and and you know, a lot of the real estate agents' reputation is. A good chunk of it is deserved um, for for being like really annoying um, people. So so my wife and I are looking at a house. I don't know how many years ago it was. And you come in and you have to fill out your name and your phone number and your email address. And, you know, I always give them a garbage email address, jackass at yahoo.com or whatever. <laughs> and then they start – you have to show a photo ID like – and uh, I asked one agent, we were looking at a house around the corner from here, really lovely house mm-hmm. that we're, we said, we're not shopping, but we've always loved this house. We wanted to see it. It's on a main road, but. And I go, but to be truth be told, every house I've ever bought, I said the exact same thing. So I asked the agent, what, photo ID, why do, why did, what's, what's with all this, I, you know, name, phone number, address, photo ID? Well, she says, and this is just smacks of urban legend. You know, there have been some situations where real estate agents have murdered. I said, well, you know, if you've met enough real estate agents, that makes perfect sense. And just completely, no, my wife starts to crack up. The agent just completely deadpanned, like right over her head. Well, I go, yes, yeah, she goes, Ed, that's why we, that's why we require ID. It's uh, most of the agents in the state are doing it. And I just <laughs> like, well. Just just made me laugh. I, I haven't thought about that in years, but it's like, <laughs> oh, well, murdering real estate agents. I'm not saying I support that, but I well, understand. Well, the, the, the scenario that you began <laughs> with, by the way, sounded like the real estate agent. There was some epidemic of real estate agents or, or people looking at homes murdering the homeowner. It's a total urban legend. <laughs> it was, I've, there's well, no, it was, no evidence COVID. anywhere that right. real estate agents It's like agents kidnapping. Were getting, right. We're getting killed. And it's like, but the joke was, but if they are getting killed, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, anyone who's bought a house, you can understand. And um, she just didn't find it funny. Well, the the point but is, you are actually one of the people who saw the housing bubble uh, back in 2007. And 2004, what? 5, yeah. So I you, was writing, you got a screaming of, about it yeah. for a while. And no, those were good times. Well, you got you got credibility, sadly, as a result. I mean, sadly, as a result, sadly, because yeah. of that, those things had to happen. But you got a lot of credibility there. And But that was a completely different situation uh, caused... If we're going to shorthand it by the deregulation of the financial industry and and banks um, making crazy bets, it wasn't the supply right. and demand issue that you're talking about right now. So easier well, to it. when you prior to the early 2000s, if you wanted to get a mortgage to buy a house, you had to have a FICO score and prove that you can afford this property and demonstrate your work history and demonstrate your income history. And, you know, you had all these hoops you had to jump through. Once you say to the country, listen, we don't care if you have a job, we don't care if you have income, we don't care what your credit history is, if you're willing to sign the dotted line, we'll give you enough money to buy the house. In, in Bailout Nation, I, my favorite example I used were these two, I don't remember if they were strawberry or grape pickers, uh, uh, a husband and wife. Hmm. I, I believe they were legal migrant farm workers. And if each of them took 100% of their pre-tax income, they still would default on the mortgage. There's just, they were not collectively the two of them. Assume they don't eat, they don't pay anything else. They just, 100% of their salary went to the mortgage. It still wasn't enough. They would have, would have defaulted. And once you're, you're at a point where it just becomes hot potato, hey, how fast can I sell this mortgage to somebody else? It, that that's just a matter of time before that blows up. And pretty much uh, all of the factors that went into the financial crisis, the centerpiece of Bailout Nation has this great graphic of all these factors that were driving us towards this disaster. I, I don't see any of those things taking place other than really low rates. Um, but it's really low rates following a crisis, not really low rates that are one of the contributing factors to the crisis. You know, once you have that crash, you get a reset. We still have, we still are suffering from the effects of the financial crisis. How so? When, when we talk about people who are underemployed, right? When we talk about 12% of the population has not, 
earned what they were earning previously to the financial crisis. U6 unemployment is a technical term, meaning people are either working part-time when they want full-time, they're taking a, a job that's much lower paying than they were, they were getting paid before the, you know, before the crisis. We have a lot of people who are underemployed. Mm. They're working, but they ain't making anywhere near what they were making pre-GFC. And so that's part of the reason why I don't see inflation anywhere out there. People have been screaming that inflation is coming. And when you you see all of that, you by the way, there was a ton of inflation, 04, 05, 06, 07, right up to you know, 08, 09, in the midst of the worst inflation in decades, none of the usual inflation people saw the inflation. Right Now we've had nothing but deflation with these occasional spasms of inflation. And the same wrong way inflationistas are now, you know, screaming, here comes inflation. Wait, you actually missed real inflation. Where were you when milk was $7 a gallon and the price of steak <laughs> went through the roof and you know, oil hit $150 a barrel. What the hell? That doesn't count. Now, 15 years later, suddenly, now you're seeing inflation? Idiots, don't don't bother me with that uh, nonsense. I also- that, that sort of stupidity really pisses me off. I have so little patience for the people who are consistently wrong about shit. Yeah. Like- uh, the, the the COVID stuff has been annoying me lately. What part? Um, so my buddy Derek Thompson wrote a great piece about the man who was the wrongest person about the pandemic. He and was on the show last week. Love Derek Thompson. He, yeah. Derek is awesome. I, I love Derek. But I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, to be fair, I'm not sure if you could name one person Who's the wrongest guy? You, the guy he named, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, uh, Alex Berenson. Berenson, that's yeah. right. Former New York Times reporter. Yep. He's bad, but then so was Richard Epstein, the the guy who influenced the Trump policy. So if you want to, Berenson is bad, but he's just a gadfly. Richard Epstein actually influenced policy that led to half a million plus deaths. I don't know who he is. So he's one of these. Uh, he said, "Well, we'll never see five thousand deaths from this. Fifty thousand would be shocking." And then, and then there was this other guy who who wrote, who's like a tech wanker out in Silicon Valley, who wrote this whole thing about, um, you know, he, he wrote this very popular Substack that proved to be wildly wrong. And then there's this guy Polymath on Twitter who said, I got $10,000 to say we won't get anywhere near 500,000 dead. That would be a nightmare. We won't see it. That uh, was 31820. He has since deleted that tweet. Uh, and then just today, Dr. Drew. Yeah, what did he, pin. somebody just sent me that. What did he do? So, so the first, you, you, you're you familiar with the, the first rule of holes, right? Have mm, you ever heard this before? I don't, th I don't think so. Oh, when you find yourself in the hole, stop digging. And Dr. Drew hasn't figured that out. So he not only was wrong about COVID in February, March, and April, but embarrassingly so. And then Schmuck gets COVID. You're a doctor. How are you getting COVID? Right. Like, don't you know the protocols? If anybody shouldn't get COVID, I guess you're a doctor second and a TV yachts first. And then today he starts talking about you know, the the vaccine passports. He tweeted these vaccine passports segregate people and strip them of their freedom to travel internationally. Vac so does a state driver's license. The state requires you to get a driver's license so you don't hope to hurt people when you move about the well, road. Hold on. The vaccine passports are controversial, right? I mean, well, come on. You stop. don't think so? Such bullshit. Oh, I, I, no, I, I think it's nonsense. OK, tell you what, if Delta requires proof of vaccine and American doesn't. I'm voting with my dollars. I don't want to fly <laughs> yeah. on. Right. I don't need, even though I am now fully vaccinated, I don't nice. need to be on a plane full of idiots. Right. Let them fly Spirit Airline. In fact, <laughs> Spirit, we're here for idiots is what their actual should They should have their should own be. airline, an anti-vax airline. Right. right. And, and anti Aircraft maintenance, anti-pilot, whatever. Yeah, no, Do it doesn't have engines. You, it, you just trust it'll fly. It's a glider. <laughs> so I, I have no patience for the anti-vaxxers. I have yeah. no patience for from the generation that has completely given up all of their privacy and personal data somehow saying. And the, the ironic thing is, yeah. 
And and I, I was whining about um, America's dumbest, dumbest governor. That's a registered trademark for uh, Ron DeSantis of Florida. Oh, Harvard who, guy. Who, He's that who dumb. Who basically, huh? right, he pretends to be, you know, an aw shucks sort of guy, but he's well-educated, basically is preventing companies from saying, if you want to come into our store, you have to wear a mask and be vaccinated. If you want to come into our office, wear you know, let, all these free market guys are just full of crap. Let the marketplace decide. I'll vote with my dollars. You, you, you don't want to require people to get vaccines by the state. That's fine. But I don't want to go to a concert unless I know I'm not going to get sick because the concert is filled with idiots. I don't want to go to a movie theater. You should have to, fl- you know, you have to flash your license when you walk into a bar. You have to flash your vaccine before you go into a place where you and your stupidity are going to put other people at risk. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't need to wear a mask or a vaccine, I'm allowed to drive as fast as I want. It's really, if, if, if that policy were in effect, I don't know if it would hurt churches or not, but there's a huge controversy right now, uh, really interesting, about how evangelical churches especially are having a very hard time convincing their parishioners to get vaccinated. <laughs> I say you open up the doors, let them all in, yeah. close the doors yep. and windows, <laughs> yeah, let fine. Jesus sort it out. Let- <laughs> I'm okay with that. I'm okay hey, with that. You can't say that. I can say that. Oh, all right. Too soon. The Easter was yesterday. Right. You're right. Jewish. It's <laughs> And I'm not I'm not saying that to be sacrilegious. No, I, I'm it's saying true. that because yes, I, I, the, I don't the have... evangelicals, by the way, have proven themselves to be amongst the most amoral, yes, hypocritical absolutely right. D bags that yep. the country has seen. It's it's so let them let them all you you feel bad about the innocent people who don't know better the kids the elderly this is basic science come on man figure it out let me ask you about you know, another recent blog post of yours very interesting purple purposeless capital uh, yes. the questions are what is the purpose of money and to those fortunate enough to have accumulated a great fortune. Towards what purpose is that capital aimed? Good questions, and you offer some very interesting answers in this piece. Go ahead. Yeah, so so there's a, a, a family office run by this guy who used to be part of Tiger Management. All the people who left Tiger to open their own funds are all called Tiger Cubs. And Bill Huang of, I always pronounce the firm wrong, Archegos Capital is a firm that Really, he came out of nowhere, like very stealthy, and in a very short period of time, accumulated $20 billion in assets. And that's kind of unusual. Uh, To make a billion dollars is a rare thing, especially purely trading, just buying and selling stuff. $20 billion, that's a giant chunk of money. That's like all-time legend amounts of, you know, that's, that's... more than Ray Dalio, that's more than Stevie Cohen, Ray Dalio of Bridgewater, Stevie Cohen of Sack, Jim Simons of Renaissance. These are like amongst the greatest producing hedge funds in history. This guy comes out of nowhere and no one really knew how he did it. Well, it turned out he was just using a ton of leverage, meaning he was borrowing a lot of money. And just every time he won, he would double. It's like being in Vegas and every time the, you win the roulette wheel, Double it up again, more, more, just kept going. And one of the things we always explain to people is that, you know, your portfolio expresses a viewpoint and a position, right? It expresses a certain risk tolerance and it expresses what you think the world is going to look like in the future. Uh, But more importantly, it expresses a purpose, meaning Either you're saving money for your kid's college or to buy a house or for retirement, or if you accumulate a couple of more dollars, well, then you're saving money for the next generation or more money than that. Philanthropy and and charity and foundations, there is a purpose to a pool of capital and money, as I described in that piece, money married to a purpose can do magic, could do amazing things. I mean, a perfect example Look at how many lives the Gates Foundation has saved from hunger, from malaria, from all these things. Literally, it's millions of of human lives saved, right? But money without a purpose is problematic because why do you want more money unless 
there's a goal for it. And I'm not talking about someone who just ate and doesn't have their next meal lined up. I, I mean, at once you're worth a billion, you know, the, the truth is there's no difference between one billion and two billion. I know you're going to say a billion dollars, but there really isn't a different. What, what can you do with two billion that you can't right. do with one billion? It's right. just so. So when someone has 20 billion dollars and they're running crazy leveraged, crazy concentrated, lots of borrowed money. You know, the problem with borrowing money to buy a risky asset like stocks is that all right, hypothetically, you ha- you put up $10 of capital and you borrow $90. So now with your $10, you can buy $100 worth of stock. If the stock goes from 100 to 110, well, that's fantastic. You just doubled your money. You started with 10, you borrowed 90. Now you have 20. You went from 10 to 20. You doubled your money. The problem is if it goes from 100 to 90, you're 100% wiped out. Right. And this guy got lucky for a long time. And, you know, I, I've jokingly said if you set the speed record on the straightaway on a racetrack, but you can't make the turn at the end and you hit the wall and blow up, the record doesn't count. And that's what this guy was doing. This guy was just, you know, when you look at his portfolio, very concentrated, very leveraged, extremely risky, right? I don't want to go too far into the weeds with, with some of the technicals of this. But you, you say to yourself, what is this person expressing with this portfolio? What do they want to accomplish with this? The only answer is more, and more, and more. I want more and I want it now, right? Right. I'm not willing to wait to get rich slowly, even though I'm already rich. This guy's worth $20 billion. Yeah. When, when you're worth 20, do you recall the conversation we had about the bit guy, Bitcoin guy who called me late in 2017, the first time Bitcoin went crazy? Right. When Remind up, me. The first time I went up to twenty thousand uh-huh. dollars. So I, I knew I, I, I wrote a column about it, but I think you and I talked about it. Yeah, I recall the, talking about it. And and the conversation goes something like this. Listen, this isn't about returns, this isn't about performance, this isn't about any of that stuff. This is about regret minimization. And ask yourself <laughs> this question. If Bitcoin is at 20,000, that's where it was in December of 2017. If you sell half of it and it goes down, how do you feel? Well, I would feel bad, but you would feel worse than if you didn't sell any of it and it went down to $7 or 7,000, which is what it did. Here's the flip side. If you sell half of it and it keeps going, how do you feel? Well, I would feel bad I sold some of it, but I still have half, and so I don't feel too bad. So which scenario is the worst for you, selling half and having it go up or not selling half and having it go down? What happens if I sell half and it goes down? Well, then you could buy it back cheaper. You could buy it back right. three times as much. Right. But, but when you have $50 million and you're a steam fitter, I'm not exaggerating, that's life changing amounts of money that pays for all your kids college, probably all your nieces and nephews college. It pays for your retirement, your mortgage. Like uh, now, whatever you have to worry about in life, basic financial security is not one of them. What are you risking that for? So that's with 40 or $50 million. When you have $20 billion, you have to say to yourself, what the fuck is this guy thinking? (laughs) Pedal to the metal. I, I, I'm just, I'm Dude. always shocked at that sort of behavior. Maybe he was just a junkie. Listen, when I was on a trading desk, it was a lot of fun. It was really exciting. Right. And, and you know, I used to joke about, I'm always looking for a right. vein. And, right. and, I mean, it's it's a thrill. But you write, you write in this piece, across the entirety of my career, I've repeatedly witnessed pe- uh, talented people get destroyed by their own refusal to get rich slowly. There are just too many ways for investors to submarine their own prospects, but a lack of patience is perhaps the most consistent destroyer of wealth broadly seen. And you have this hilarious joke in this where you write, the SEC should explore replacing the Series 7 exam with the Stanford Marshmallow Test. Right. You're familiar with the Marshmallow yeah, yeah. Test? Yeah, it's the idea that you have no patience. So, you, yes. I, I, so <laughs> I love it. I love you. that. I I worked with a guy. I, I won't mention. But most him. importantly, sorry, you 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 already kind of said this, but the, the the you said that the you just basically articulated this. But the reason we deeply integrate planning into wealth management that money without a goal 
is mere lucre. What's that? Lucre. Capital without purpose is simply currency awaiting mischief. Well written, sir, and well analyzed. I, I think that's really well analyzed. I can well turn analyzed. quite a phrase, yeah, right? Yeah, well, you've always been a great writer, but I mean, I think that's... That's so true. This is such a fascinating piece. I'm not, you know, an expert on investment, but I get interested when you're talking about it. So yeah, I love I, I love on Fridays to sometimes just wax philosophical. Lucre lucre, lucre. is a biblical term. Uh, Post Easter, oh. we can talk about that. Okay, where money is regarded as sordid because it was obtained in a dishonorable way. Hmm. So so filthy lucre is is the is the expression with that. So so uh, just to compare and contrast. And I, I, the first person I won't mention name, I worked with a guy who was an incredibly talented salesperson. This has got to be like 20 years ago. Yeah. Late 90s, early 2000s. This guy could sell ice cubes to the Eskimo. A condom just, to the Pope. Right. Just like incredibly talented. And, and I remember seeing him do a series of things that were, let's just call them borderline dubious. <laughs> And it's like, dude, why don't you just find a quality product, learn all there is to learn about it, and use this fucking ungodly sales skill you have to just make people a shit ton of money over the long haul? You're 20-something. By the time you're 30, you'll be a millionaire. And by the time you're 40, you'll be a multi, multi, multi-millionaire, and you'll have no headaches. You don't understand. You got to make hay when the sun is shining. That was the phrase that came back to me. By the way, one of my favorite things about my partner, Josh Brown, yeah. who is also a very talented salesperson. But by the way, this other guy, like Jordan Belford, Wolf of Wall Street, talented. Like my favorite scene in that movie is when he walks into this crappy boiler room <clears throat> sales place and picks up the phone and just starts pitching this guy on a stock and the whole room just like stops to listen to, holy crap, this guy is an amazing salesperson. Right. Like we've all met people like sure. that. Sure, yeah. Um, this guy was that and then some, you know, charismatic and likable and until you realize, oh, he's just another asshole full yep. of crap. Yep. My partner, very talented salesperson, always had the smarts to be willing to get rich slowly. And not everybody has that. And what eventually happens is these guys just, their careers get destroyed. They get thrown out of the industry. Some of them go to jail. But I've seen this too many times to count. I right. mean, you could almost smell it on people. Are they taking shortcuts? What are they doing? And and this guy was literally a billionaire. He's wiped out. He's completely worthless now. And it's astonishing. It's uh, like, who does that? Like, if you, I promise, if anybody wants to give me a billion dollars personally to see what I would do it with it, and, and I've written columns what to do when you win the lottery, you take 5 or 10% out and you go crazy with it. Have a good time. Buy some crazy cars, houses, make it rain, give money to your family, whatever. But the rest of your money, you have to put that in a place where it's not going to disappear on you. It's it's just too rare and valuable to fuck around with. I'm always shocked when I see people. It, it it's it's amazing to me, and it I watch it time and again. I've seen it. Listen, I've been in finance for just about three decades. Is that right? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more like 25 years. Oh, yeah, well, that's like, a major I'm a difference. Kid. Yeah, I'm a newbie. But I've watched it over and over again, and sure. it's just, it's astonishing to me. Uh, what purpose does your capital serve? Have a plan for it. I love that piece. Uh, all right, I'll let you go. I appreciate your time, as always. It's so great, uh, mostly listening to you and just trying to ask you questions that set I you know, up. I know, I just, can I tell you, in my podcast... The, the you spend more time listening than talking. Oh God, it's well, like yeah, but that's I, how it's, it's supposed taken to be. me a while to get there. But it's like a four to one ratio of that's guests, good. That's good, right? Maybe it's even more. 
But but you when, ask awesome I, questions. I'm like the worst podcast guest because I'm just unruly, and it's like I have all this pent up not true crap to talk about. Not true. So. Not according to this audience. Uh, I thank you very much. I have to go. I have to go be a podcast guest on. Uh, oh really? Where yeah. are you going to be a podcast? Uh, guest? The David Feldman Show. He's a very funny uh, comedy writer and stand up comedian who has a has a podcast and uh, really? always like David joining. David yeah. Feldman. Yeah. Let's take a look. Yep. Yeah. Oh, he's a comedian. He's got his own Wikipedia entry. Yep, yep. Isn't that fantastic? He's been around and he's for a while. He's IMDb. He's Didn't written, he do... Uh, written some good stuff and always very funny, neurotic, kind oh, of really? Jewish, lefty. Forced to pick a major in high school. All right. Yeah. Hey, man. Always great to see you. Enjoy the shed. And uh, everything else good? Everything's good, man. I uh, We haven't gotten a refund. We haven't gotten any money. How what about that? The government. We didn't get any uh, relief, any, any COVID relief. How could that be? We got the check. We got uh, the last check. Are you making too much money? No, there's no possible way. No, I don't know. Uh, we have we have friends. We have we know other people too. So we've uh, I've reached out to my accountant. I'm on top of it, but that seems weird, right? Um, I think you don't qualify. No, I think you're making too much. No, 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 no way. Maybe I got my check. I don't know where you. Maybe is. while I was here, they're just looking at tw- <laughs> 2019 or something because it's certainly. Um, no, it would be the last tax year. Yeah, but we got we got the uh, a refund before we got the Trump money. I think a refund yeah. or, or not or a refund. The, we got the the, uh, the the thing that everybody else got the CARES Act. Yeah, we got that. My mom got that. I so didn't we get should, that. But yeah, we we got like that. My, so we should my get this. Right? Like my mom's account doesn't make sense. I'm I'm like Joe. That's the CARES Act. Yeah. She's like, oh, that's where that money came. No, we I should think be it was like uh, twelve hundred bucks. What was it last? We time? should be getting because we have kids too. We have, we we have uh, two kids. Two dependents. Hmm. Yeah. I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that cold sweetheart cash. You're looking for that Sam. Biden, Biden. Looking for that green. Biden. All right, man. Biden have a, uh, have <laughs> right. a good show. And, Thank uh, you, buddy. I appreciate it very much. My All right. pleasure. Later. Stand up. All right. There he goes. Barry Ritholtz at Ritholtz. Anybody else not get their check and think that they should have? Uh, I'm pretty confused about that, but we reached out to the account today and we'll get answers. I'll let you know what happened. Thank you. Bye. Sweet, cold, hard, big government cash check. Looking forward. Okay, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much to Margaret Hoover. Please say hello to her on Twitter. Thank you for joining me as well as Barry Redholt, as always. And please consider a paid subscription to the podcast if you haven't already subscribed. And if you really listen a lot and you're a subscriber, maybe you can up your subscription as several of you uh, do all the time. So thank you very much for all of those who do. I appreciate it. Hope to see you Thursday night at the virtual stand-up happy hour hangout. Join us anytime on the Discord platform, because if you're a member of the stand-up community, you are never alone. So many great folks that are members of our community, including John Carroll, who wrote this song for us. Johnny, take it away, baby. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know. It's his time to know. To make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up Stand oh, up Oh, got to stand up Oh, come on Just stand up Everybody got to stand up In the darkest hour Stand up People got the power Stand up Hello, show enders. And here now is a little history, about a minute and 15 seconds, about the Voting Rights Act at 50 from 2015 on TimeMagazine.com. It was the summer of 1965, and President Lyndon B. Johnson had, just a year prior, signed the Civil Rights Act. The landmark bill prohibited discrimination based on gender, religion, nationality, and race. 
Back then, time marveled at the enormity of the bill's passing. Throughout the South, from Charleston to Dallas, from Memphis to Tallahassee, segregation walls that had stood for several generations began to tumble in the first full week under the new civil rights law. But the act did little to stop discrimination against blacks who sought to vote. The march from Selma to Montgomery, led by Martin Luther King Jr., spelled a bloody experience. The Negroes' struggle to achieve the right to vote exploded into an orgy of police brutality, of clubs and whips and tear gas, and of murder. We are moving and we cannot afford to stop because Alabama and because our nation has a date with destiny. Five months later, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law, as time noted. Black Americans were finally claiming freedom's fundamental right. And they they're were still trying to vote. I'm Pete Dominic. This is Stand Up Daily. I'll talk to you tomorrow.